The Unabomber case caused havoc for close to two decades across the US. The Unabomber was active for 18 years from 1978 through to 1996 and during this period of time there was a six year hiatus between 1987 and 1993. And the Unabomber case was one of the more extensive law enforcement manhunts across America with a $1 million reward being offered at the time for the capture. And the name Unabomber emerged in the early years with the early bombings targeted at universities and also airlines. And it was essentially the pairing of those two sectors that resulted in the term the Unabomber. And across the bombings over the 18 years, three people were killed and another 23 were injured. Now, in the early days, there was the belief that the bomber may have been residing in Chicago, but then as the bombings changed throughout the years and the locations changed, there was then belief that the bomber may have in fact moved and potentially had relocated to California. Now, eight of the bombings occurred in Northern California and also from 1993 onwards, all the bombs were also mailed in the San Francisco area, which led to the belief that the bomber therefore may be residing in California. Now, the bomber's bombs were constructed as a form of pipe bomb with an anti-movement and anti-opening firing switches with the mixture of both ammonium nitrate and aluminium powder as the key ingredients in the bombs. They were all handmade and that comprised of both metal and wood components in the bomb construction. Now each bomb was well crafted with there being no fingerprints or no DNA evidence on the bombs and some bombs had the initials FC inscribed on parts of the bombs. Now it was not too many years later that the communication though between the bomber and public agencies and law enforcement agencies emerged. Now in the early days of the Unabomber bombings, the FBI became involved in the case and provided a profile in relation to who they believed the bomber to be. And there was quite a bit of division that emerged in the FBI regarding the profile. And a lot of the aspects of the profile that we used in the early days really reflected many of the similarities to the mad bomber. So there was the idea, particularly amongst the profile that was provided by John Douglas at the time, that the individual was an underachiever, they would have some connections to academia, they'd be relatively antisocial, in their late 30s to 40s. They'd drive an old car, but it would be kept in a good condition. They'd be a controlling type of individual with certain parts of their house being off limits as though they'd have their own secluded area within the house where no one else would be allowed to go and this would be where the bomb making occurred. They would be preoccupied and fascinated with bombs and similar things that were related to bomb making. They'd likely keep a scrapbook, which again highlighted this preoccupation with the bombing and be obsessed with the investigations. They'd also have trouble in romantic relationships, but they'd likely still have a female in their life. They would also revisit the crime scene or the scene of the bombings, and they'd likely live in the San Francisco area or work in that area. They'd also have previously been interviewed as a suspect and they would be willing to also, of course, comply and work with law enforcement. Now, at the time of this profile being provided, there was a strong suspect by the name of Buckley Christ Jr., who was believed to be potentially the bomber. And Buckley was a university professor whose return address had been on the package of the first mail bomb. And there was the belief that Buckley had wanted to get back at the campus security who'd given him a traffic ticket at the time. However, by 1983, this profile was revised and a new profile was developed where the bomber was believed to in fact be a blue collar worker, likely working in the aeroplane industry, potentially as a mechanic, 
This was based on the types of materials that were found in the bomb. But again, this profile would, would prove to be ineffective and it would again get revised in subsequent years. Now, in 1987, there was a small breakthrough in the case when a female witness observed a man wearing a hoodie and aviator sunglasses and the individual walked across a car park and reached into a canvas bag and pulled out a board with nails that were sticking out of this. And the witness then yelled at him and the man looked back calmly and then proceeded to walk away. Now the witness was going to confront the man but the owner of the store stopped her. Now later that day the store owner's son noticed that a strange object was underneath a car and he picked this up which resulted in this object which was in fact a bomb detonating and he received injuries to his nose, eyes, skull along with being thrown 20 feet across the car park and he was very fortunate to survive but of course the level of injury was starting to become more normal and more serious as the bombings had increased over the years. And as a result of the witness observing this individual, a composite sketch was published after the incident. However, there was much contention around this sketch, with the witness claiming that it was not accurate in the early years. And subsequently, a number of years later, another sketch was released. So these factors definitely influenced the early stages of the investigation and did limit some of the accuracy with the with the sketch that was released in later years proving to be more effective. So following a number of bombings that were essentially set at a frantic pace during the 80s, the bombing suddenly ceased in 1987 and there was a growing opinion that the bomber had died. But of course after this six year hiatus the bombings resumed in 1993 and at this point the media started to receive correspondence from an anarchist group calling themselves FC. Now the note alluded to an event that was about to occur and the note was signed off with a series of numbers which were 55, 25, 43 and 94 and this was an authentic code known only by the bomber and also known only by the FBI at this point in time. So after consulting with the New York Times, the decision was made not to publish the note. And the note also caused some concern over whether the bombings were being perpetrated by more than one individual. So was it in fact a group or was it one individual, which was initially the belief? But the FBI remained adamant that a terrorist group was not behind the bombings and that it was in fact just one individual. And there were a number of different leads in the investigation across the years, with the FBI at one point compiling 12 million pages of case files across their offices. And while the FBI evidence was of course beginning to build, the bomber started further correspondence with newspapers. And one of these examples was that they mailed five times in 1995. So we had the bombings still continuing, the bomber corresponding with the newspapers, and that was leading to greater frustration within law enforcement. And ultimately, law enforcement returned to the FBI profilers and asked for the profile to be reviewed. And they looked at the original profile and the response that investigators got was that the profile was accurate and that Buckley was still the best suspect. But the tensions were certainly mounting in the case and this resulted in the FBI taking a new direction and bringing in two other profilers to review the case. And these were James Fitzgerald and Kathy Puckett. Now, both Fitzgerald and Puckett had started closely examining the body of evidence that had been building over the years, particularly the correspondence from the bomber. Now, as a result of reviewing this material, a new profile was developed, and this was largely based on the linguistic aspects of the letters that had been 
provided from the bomber. And the profile detail that they believed that the individual was rather quite meticulous and if anything potentially spy-like. They believed that they employed exceptional countermeasures to avoid detection and it would, would later be revealed that the bomber wore disguises such as a blonde wig, sunglasses, stuffed Kleenex, cotton and chewing gum into their mouth to change their facial appearance. They wore constructed shoes to make their feet appear smaller. They even collected hairs from other individuals and taped these to the explosives as precautionary and distracting measures to mislead law enforcement. And there was the belief that the bomber would be fixated on safety, security and secrecy and that the bombings were likely linked to the individual's identity and part of their identity was that they had an obsessive compulsive type of personality but they would be very organized, very perfectionistic and they'd be burdened by a deep anger and underlying sense of fear. So following the new profile we then had a manifesto emerge and in 1995 the bomber mailed the New York Times and the Washington Post a 56 page essay which became known as the Unabomber Manifesto and the bomber offered to stop his attacks if the manifesto was published. Yet the bomber was clear that if the manifesto was not published that he would renew his campaign of bombings with more bloodshed to come. Now, there was considerable debate around whether to publish the manifesto, and ultimately this was eventually published in the Washington Post and the New York Times, with the manifesto being approximately 35,000 words in length, entitled Industrial Society and Its Future. And the FBI hoped that by publishing the manifesto, someone would recognize the writings. And the manifesto claimed that the Industrial Revolution had significant consequences on society, with technology suppressing individual freedom and destroying nature. So instead of technology satisfying human needs, humans have modified themselves to fit around technology. And this essentially indicated that humans were conforming to machines. And the example that was provided in the manifesto was the idea of the traffic light, which dictated to, in, to people when they were allowed to and when they were not allowed to move, essentially impeding our freedom. And ultimately the manifesto claimed that we needed to eliminate industrial society and protect nature. And the Unabomber's manifesto was greeted in 1995 by many thoughtful people and academics as a work of genius. For example, Cynthia Ozick from The New Yorker stated that the Unabomber was a philosophical criminal of exceptional intelligence and humanitarian purpose. And he was driven to commit murder out of an uncompromising idealism. So after publication of the manifesto, FBI profilers Fitzgerald and Puckett sought about conducting a linguistic analysis on the manifesto. And they began to look at both the language used and also the style of writing. And the bomber wrote about children and the impact that technology had on them. He also believed that humans were out of touch with nature and regularly utilized terms such as freedom and also industrial. He also wrote about depression, low self-esteem and the emptiness that was evident in life, which Puckett believed was the bomber describing his own internal and psychological state. He also mentioned inferiority, psychological problems with sex and love, which again seemed to provide some insight into the bomber's psychological mindset and psychological state at the time. And there was an overarching belief that emerged in the manifesto that technology was evil. Now, one individual, David Kaczynski, recognized the writings in the manifesto and he realized that the writings actually belonged to his brother Ted. 
And after notifying police, Ted Kaczynski was finally arrested and charged with the offences of the last 18 years as the Unabomber. Now, upon analysis or psychological analysis, it was determined that Kaczynski had paranoid schizophrenia or alternatively delusional disorder. And the opinion was that he was not fit to stand trial. But he was also a remarkably intelligent individual with an alleged IQ of 167. He also had quite an extensive academic background, having commenced at Harvard as essentially a gifted child at the age of only 16. He had a PhD in mathematics and was an assistant professor at the University of California. Now, during his time at Harvard, he underwent mind control experiments, allegedly intended to assist the CIA. And there's some opinion that this may have had a detrimental impact on his psychological well-being. Now, Kaczynski lived alone in isolation in a small cabin in the woods that was five miles from the nearest town. He had no technology in his cabin and he would often travel extensive lengths carrying the bombs with him, even on buses to get to his location where he would then mail or plant the bomb. He had no running water, no gas or electricity, which really highlighted his conviction in relation to the evils of technology. And it really reflected his commitment to the cause. And so he would struggle through the freezing cold winters without heat, which is really quite remarkable. Now, he was arrested finally in 1996 at his cabin. And at the time, many more bombs were found constructed still inside his cabin, ready to be deployed. Now, he agreed to plead guilty in exchange for the death penalty being removed. And ultimately, he was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole on the 4th of May, 1998.